Everybody ready? Shalom. Today is uh, the Torah portion is called Hukat or Statutes. And uh, we have been uh, journeying uh, from the numbers, the book of numbers, the first uh, eight chapters talks about the ideal society and, uh, and how we are to, uh, to, uh, to uh, emulate the, the lives of the Levites, how they carry the, the, the word of God, how they offer their lives for divine service. And not only to Hashem, but also to, 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 to their fellow man. And then what happened? Leshon Hara happened. Leshon Hara happened. Evil speak. When the, and then uh, what Torah portion to the next Torah portion, we see how, uh, you know, Leshon Hara has impacted the lives of the children of Israel. And what's interesting is the, 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 the Torah portion to cut is literally 38 years. So in other words, God literally skipped from, from the incident of Korah, the, the rebellion of Korah, after they rejected the land. And the, the, the next 38 years, God does not record anything about what happened to them. And now it skips back. It, this is a 39th year, they're about, 39 going to the 40th year, they're about to exit the wilderness and enter the promised land. And then what happens? Again, the, the cycle happens again. Every time that we are about to enter God, the kingdom of God, the enemy works overtime. And you'll see here that the enemy starts to, to create an issue again with the manna. And, uh, and then uh, the, 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 the water incident happened. Of course, Miriam dies. And, uh, and uh, we see here, there's two themes in the store portion. The first one, uh, it's talks of, talking about to cut or statutes, which are that logical. And then the minor, the second theme of, it, of this Torah portion we're going to study this morning is the disqualification of Moses. What, what brought about, uh, what can we learn when we try to understand why Moses, despite his pleas, God said, you are not to bring children of Israel. So, and the minor topics, of course, the death of Miriam that brought about the third water crisis and the death of Aaron and Eliasar taking over. So if you are new to the channel, yes, are you ready? Uh, we are a Messianic congregation. So if you want to join our Zoom, it starts at 10.30 a.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time, Toronto time. And the Zoom details are there. So before that, go to the next slide. So before we go into uh, uh, our study this morning, so for a quick summary, so we're gonna talk about the third water crisis after the death of Miriam and why Moses was not allowed to bring the children of Israel to the promised land. So we're gonna see some different insights. And then we're gonna talk about what is a chukat? What is a, a, what is a uh, statute? And we're going to look at the two chukat that could not be explained logically, except when we connect it to the Messiah. So uh, on the next slide, you see here, there are three types of Torah. There are three types of laws. The first one is what we call the commandments or mitzvah. They have mitzvah, mitzvah. Uh, or mitzvah, which is plural. So the commandments are, uh, if you think about the commandments, the better way to translate commandments is it's connected to the word uh, um, uh, mitz, mitzah, which means to join or to band together. So what, what uh, the Torah is telling us that the commandments are really things that connect us to God. Example of these commandments, of course, is uh, in dot or witness laws, like for example, the observance of Shabbat. When we observe Shabbat, that means we are aligning ourselves to a certain um, to a certain movement. Why? Me meaning this is what God commanded us to do. So therefore, we're aligning ourselves to what God wants. When we when we participate in God's feast, 
Again, we are aligning ourselves. We are, we are uh, connecting ourselves to the things that God wants us to do. God, God established this feast and we participate in it. Uh, commands that our commandments can be two ways. One, serving God. We do things that pleases God. And then the other portion of the commandments is uh, when we serve others. Like, for example, taking care of widows and orphans. As an example. Another example is when we forgive a person that did us wrong. So with that, Father, we just re we, we, we're, remind we're reminded of, of Warasha. Warasha, Father, we lift her up before you. And mm. this morning we lift her up before you, Father. Mm. May you may you guide her. Amen. May you bring people in her life that will, that will that will lead her and guide her as she navigates uh, her situation with uh, being a widow and with two children with no job. But Father, you are the one who provides for her, Father. We thank you for reminding us of Warasha. So again, we think of mitzvah, commandments. The root word, I guess, is mitzvah, which means to bind us like super glue. It means to connect us. Also, it means to be part of a team. That's why, this, let's say, you know, that's why the people of God, they worship when? On Shabbat. The people of God, what feast or festival do they observe? The feast of the Lord. Amen? Amen. So when we align ourselves, when we do the things of God, we are like becoming part of what? We're like becoming part of a team. Amen? Mm. Mishpat, or in the other hand, judgment or ordinances are laws that deal with tort law. What is tort law? These are obligations, accountability. These are practical day-to-day -day living. When you harm another person, there are law consequences. When you own property, like, sister, like uh, Brother Denzel and Sister uh, Clara, when you own property and there's a dispute, the, the word of God uh, is not only dealing with spiritual matters. See that it's not only, only dealing with, with spiritual matters, matters, but it deals with our everyday life. Say that everyday life. everyday life. Why? Because we need to exist not only in the spiritual world, but also in the physical world. That's why God created Adam. Remember? When, well, that's why God, because God is already king of the spiritual world. And God said, I want you, I want. I'm creating mankind. I want mankind also to be uh, king of the physical world. So then it comes back to chuka. The chuka or chuk in uh, plural, we call it the English statutes. These are ritual laws or temple service. Most of them, say that most of them, most of them. cannot be explained logically. Why? Because our human minds cannot comprehend, comprehend. Yeah. God. Amen? Yeah. So, for example, is this the ashes of the red heifer. Yeah. Even Solomon, the wisest person in, in the book of Ecclesiastes, he said, I can understand all, most all things, but he could not understand the ashes of the red heifer. Yeah. Another chuka is, of course, the kosher laws. Of course, the, the, the brazen serpent. Why did God uh, ask Moses to create a brazen serpent? So a, a, a lot of these things we cannot explain on our own. Mm. But when, when today we're, we're, we're trying to attempt to, to try to relate the ashes of the red heifer and the brazen altar back to the Messiah. So again, there's no logic to, uh, to it. Something uh, sometimes when our parents tell us, right? When we're growing up, they tell us, um, you know, don't go to these places. And you don't understand what, why, why, why? So, you know, we don't understand, but we, but we just do it. Say we just do it. We just follow it. Like for example, the, the God said, don't mix seed. When you're planting, don't mix corn with rice. Mm. So it, it, uh, during that time and even today, you know, uh, you know, it can't be explained. Maybe they, now they can explain it scientifically, but then, and then don't mix wool and linen. Why? why? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, today they, they, they try to explain. They say that wool and linen emits positive energy. Yes. Yeah. So, but if you're wearing the same positive energy, it will nullify itself. It has to be positive and negative to, to in, uh, enable to what? 
to create spark, right? Positive and positive is no good, right? Try putting uh, your your putting a flashlight with the wrong battery polar, meaning if it says positive, you put the negative, and if it says negative, you should put the positive. Tell me if it's gonna lie. It's not gonna lie. Why? Because two positives will not will not work. That's why you know it has to be a what? A male and a female. Amen. Are you see with me? So anyway, so so tukat are things that cannot be explained, and we're going to talk about the tukat. But before we go into the next slide, before we go into the tukat, we're going to explain first why Moses was not allowed to enter the promised land. So here, or was not allowed to to uh, to bring the children of Israel to the promised land. So if you remember, the first water crisis. When 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 was the first water crisis happened? The first water crisis happened. Say that three days, say that three days, three days. after okay. leaving Egypt. So they, they went to the river, they, they crossed the Red Sea, they went to the wilderness of Sur, and what happened? Three days later in the wilderness, they found no water. And then what happened? They came to Mara and they drank the water, but it was bitter. So what did they do? Uh, uh, God told Moses to get a tree, a particular tree, and toss it into the water. So here again, to explain this miracle, you get you need to understand that Yeshua is the tree. Amen. Yeshua was the tree that was thrown into the bitter waters of sin. And as a result of Yeshua being thrown into the sea, what happened? The water, the water became sweet. Amen. So again, again, pointing back to Yeshua. So that's the world, first water crisis. Guess what? When was the next water crisis? Go to the next slide. The second water crisis happened. What happened? When? Three days after they left Mara. What happened? And again, the, the congregation of children of Israel went from the wilderness of sin after their journeys, according to the command of the Lord, and pitched in Rephidim. In Rephidim, again, there was no water. Why three days? Why? Because when they filled their, their, their vats with water, guess what? It was only good for three days. So after the third day, there's a second, the second water crisis. And what did God command Moses? And God, God said to Moses, go to the rock. Say that, go to the rock. A particular rock. And I said, and he said to, to Moses, I want you to strike the rock. So Moses struck the rock. And what happened? The water gushed. Amen. So you would think that third water crisis will happen when? Three days later. But no, go to the next slide. So what happened is for 39 years, see that for 39 years, after the second water crisis, instead of three days, 39 years later, in Numbers chapter 20, verse 1 to 4, and the children of Israel, when the whole congregation came into the wilderness of sin on the first month, and the, uh, the people abode in Kodesh, Miriam died there and was buried there. Verse 2, and there was no water for the congregation. And they assembled themselves together against Moses. So, so here, go to the next slide. So, so, so here we see here the third water crisis was 39 years later. So where were they getting the water? So the question is, where did the water come from? So it says there that the clue is in verse where it says there, Miriam's well is actually the rock. See that the rock, Yeshua that followed him or followed them in the journey in the wilderness. And it's somehow connected to Miriam. Why? Because this rock, uh, Miriam, maybe Miriam danced before the rock. And somehow the rock, uh, the water flow because of Miriam. So it, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Again, this is the oral Torah. Paul is quoting the oral Torah. He says, that in the connection with the cloud and with the sea, they were all immersed, baptized themselves in Moshe, and they all ate from the same food from the Spirit. And verse 4, and they all drank from the same drink from the Spirit, for they drank from the Spirit sent rock, which followed them, and that rock was who? The rock was the Messiah. So, so Yeshua was the rock that followed them all around for 39 years. 
The rock was following them. Amen? So Miriam died. And the punishment for Moses striking the rock instead of speaking to it. And it results he's not going to take Israel into the promised land. Now in the next Torah portion, but not now, maybe the next few uh, few Torah portion, the Bayat Kanan, Moses bent, it says there, 550 times mm. to Hashem, to allow him to enter the promised land. Yeah. The gematria of the word Bayat Kanan is 515. Why does Moses have to beg? Think about it. Many times. He could have just prayed. I have asked, I have requested, but he was refused. It's a very big teaching in, 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 in Judaism. Why? Because it says here, uh, in Judaism, they don't pray for the dead, but what they do is they go to the grave of a, a righteous uh, person and they said to God, God, by the merit of, let's say, for Isaac, uh, uh, please uh, grant my prayer. Or they go to the grave of Rachel if they're barren. There's a, they go to the grave of Rachel and said, God, by the merit of Rachel, give me a child. But they don't pray to the dead. They don't pray to the dead person. They're praying, they're reminding God of what this person has done. So it's, it's a very uh, simple concept. Why? Because we do the same. Because Yeshua said, what did Yeshua say? Pray in what? In his name. So it's not a Christian doctrine, it's, 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 it's embedded in Judaism. Remember, the very first person that prayed, remember, in the Torah, was Abraham. Say that, Abraham. Abraham. When uh, Abimelech prayed for healing, because uh, he needed healing. So uh, Abraham prayed in behalf of Abimelech. And as a result, Abimelech had, had a child, right? Are you still with me so far? So to do that, you'll need to be online. <laughs> thank you. So the law. So, um, so, 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 so again, so, so the question is, if, if Moses was a righteous uh, leader, why did God not answer his prayer or did he not? So it's a very big thing. Why? Because if Moses prayer was not answered, can you imagine? How about us? Amen. Are you still with me? Yeah. So, um, so again, uh, you know, uh, we need to understand what was the sin of, uh, of Moses. If you think about it, why did God, go to the next slide, Jesse. Why did God tell him, he said in verse 9, Moses took the rod before the Lord as he commanded. God said, take your staff and look for the rod. So if God didn't mean for Moses to hit the rock, why did God tell him to take, the, take, his, take his rod? Are you still with me? And the next question is, if we're, if, we're, if, if we're analyzing this story, when Moses struck the rock, are you still with me? When Moses struck the rock, the water also came out. So again, say that. So again, again. what's the big deal? The miracle happened, right? So, What's the difference between striking the rock and speaking to it? It resulted in a miracle. Another mind-boggling question. Remember, they were literally at the edge, say that at the edge of the promised land. Days away, very close. Again, we, where are we living today? We are living in the last of the last days. And the enemy will try to to again to 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 uh, to disqualify us in in the um, in the uh, in the in the oral in the oral Torah it says there that that it's in the Bible that but that Moses was begging God I I have served you for forty years can I not can you not let this pass can I not cross with the children of Israel he was also saying to God, God, don't, don't make me Moses anymore. Just make me like an ordinary citizen. Just let me cross to the, let me go to the promised land. And finally, the last plea of Moses. Okay, if I'm not going to go there alive, then 
I die here, but carry my body to the promised land. So that's how much Moses wanted it. I say with me. So again, here the, the question is: Moses was begging, like I said, you know, ekana means begging. Moses was begging in the middle, like, uh, and uh, and God, it almost like saying, God, you know, I didn't ask for a salary for forty years. This is the only thing I'm asking. So, if you think about it, what's the big deal again? That Moses struck the rock instead of speaking to the rock. So, so here's some insights from um, from some of the sages. He says there, uh, Moses. Uh, uh, what is the sin of Moses? Uh, one of the sin of Moses really is he had anger issues. Say that he had anger issues. Anger issues. Why? Because uh, you know Miriam just died, and um, Aaron and him they were mourning, and then he hears this people complaining about the water, complaining about no water. And then complaining about uh, later on they will be uh, later on they will be complaining of the manna, but but here they were complaining about the water, uh, you know. Uh, so uh, so what's so what happened? So Moses then he he uh, he took his staff. Moses hearing them doing leshon hara. Moses gets upset, and he says to them, "Listen to me, rebels." 40 years of serving you, you don't believe me. He gets upset. Then he strikes the rock out of frustration and anger. And as a result, he gets punished. Why is Hashem so angry? What is the difference again between hitting the rock versus speaking to the rock? In both cases, again, the miracle did happen. The water came out. And like I said, why was Moses bringing the staff with him in this first place? So Ramban mentioned that again, Moses' sin was anger. The worst character traits we can have is anger. There's two character traits that in some, in some cases, there are character traits that we need to be in the middle, not to the extreme right or to the extreme left. For example, if you are a stringy person, don't be too stringy to the left. You can be also, uh, you can be in the middle. That's the point is, but you can be generous sometimes, but according to Ramban, there are two character traits that we cannot go in the middle. We have to be in the extreme right. What does that mean? One is anger and the other one is pride. In other words, if you have these characteristics of anger, you need to go to the extreme opposite and not have any anger at all. And same thing with pride. So Ramban said Moses had anger issues. Moses, don't lose your anger or allow your anger to get the best of you. So the conclusion here is that it, the, the sin of Moses is, is anger. He had anger issues. Uh, remember when, uh, when he saw the Egyptian 80 years back, when he saw the Egyptian abusing the, a Jewish person, what did he do? He looked to the left and he looked to the right. And what did he do? He struck the Egyptian and killed the Egyptian. So that same anger, 80 years later, was still in Moses. So the hardest character to control is anger. Why? Because we need to work on this daily. See that we need to work on our anger daily. Amen. We anger makes us say things that we don't mean. Amen. Amen. Anger makes us do things that we don't mean. We, we, we don't otherwise do. But Hashem tells Moses, really, you lack faith. Again, the lesson for us in the last days, in the last days, we will be tested. It's not time to shrink back. It's the time to be bold in faith. Amen. The rock represents Yeshua. Remember, it's the rock that followed them, right? 
The rock, remember, represents Yeshua. The first time he came, the first time he came, we needed to strike him. Amen? We need to pin our sins on him. In Isaiah 53, we just sang it a while ago. He described us, he was stricken because of our transgression. It pleased the Father, it pleased the Father to bruise him. Why? Because it was taking our sins and putting it on his son. Amen? Amen. So the first time he came, it rightfully, God said, you know, strike my son. Throw every sin on him. Amen? Are you still with me? Amen. So that you can be set free. Amen? From the penalty of sin. He took our penalty, our punishment. So for the first time, the rock was struck. Living water came out. Say the living water came out. As a result of us giving our sins, what happened? The, the Bible says, out of the... the the, 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 your belly shall flow livers of living water. So living water flowed. Say that. Living water flowed. Living water flowed. When we gave our sins to Yeshua. Amen. So to bring life redemption to all of us today as believers, what do we need to do? We need to hear and what? We need to hear and obey. Amen? Now Moses was supposed to show the people that the rock was the Messiah. He will come this time not to be stricken. Again, when he comes the second time, he will not come riding on a donkey. He will come riding on what? On a white horse. A white horse symbolic of the king. He will be the king priest. So the Messiah will come this time not to be stricken again. He will come speaking. The living Torah will come teaching the Torah. Say that he will come teaching the Torah. That's why God said to Moses, speak to the rock. Why? Because now he, he will use his word. The living Torah will be teaching the Torah. So out of him, when you speak to the rock, what will, uh, what will flow? Right. Living waters. Again, living waters. Again, wow. Living waters will flow. Healing, restoration, redemption. Amen? Yeah. Go on the next slide. But if you look at verse 12, say that I'm looking at verse 12. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you believe me not to sanctify me in their eyes, the eyes of the children. Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly here. You shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. Say that. You shall not bring this assembly. So that's a very profound because God didn't tell Moses, you're not going to the promised land. He didn't say that. Are you still with me? What did he say? You shall not bring this assembly. Are you still with me? Moses got, didn't get 100% rejection. Hashem says, he accepted your prayer. You will not go to the land of Israel. Not now, but later. Say that. In the Jewish writing, say that. In the Jewish writing, they said that Moses will go to the promised land with Messiah, say that with the Mashiach, and Elijah. In the Jewish writing, say that. In the Jewish writing. They said, oh, Moses, not now. You'll come later. Because the Mashiach will bring you. Yes. You will go with the Mashiach and Elijah to the promised land. Amen. And look at what happened. Matthew chapter 17. Yes. What Pastor June just read. Yes. Yes. After six days, yes. Yeshua took Peter and Jacob and John, his brother, and brought them to the high mountain by themselves. And he was transformed before them. His face shone like the sun. Why? Why was, why, why was this? Remember, there are three offices that the, that the Messiah needs to fulfill. The first one, he has to come as a prophet, like Moses. Amen? And then, he has to come like a priest. And finally, he has to come as a king, Melech. So, so in the mountain of transfiguration, Yeshua was coming this time. He fulfilled his pro prophetic role. Now he's been transformed. Look at that. 
the, the transformation, his face shone like the sun, his garments became white as light. Why? Why, why, why? See that? Why, why? Why, why? Because he's getting ready for Yom Kippur. Remember, on Yom Kippur, the blood has to be brought into the Holy of Holies. And the priest, see that the priest, the high priest, the Kohen and the Lord, has to come wearing white. Say that wearing white. So Yeshua is fulfilling his third or second role now. He's going to come as the high priest yes, yeah. to, to enter and yes. bring his blood. And now, what is Moses' role? Remember who, who was Moses in the wilderness? Say that. Who was Moses in the wilderness? King and the priest. He was the king. No, Aaron was a priest. But he was the king. Say that. He was the king. So he was considered saying. So now, in the mountain of transfiguration, we see here prophetically Yeshua being the high priest. Elijah representing the prophet, and then Moses, even Moses reclaiming Melech, the king. That's why, behold, Moses and Elijah were seen with them conversing with him. Why? Moses has been waiting. He said, Moses, thou, which is better for you to bring the assembly of the children of Israel or with the Mashiach? Messiah? Amen. So Hashem says to, to Moses, Moses will ask, Hashem says, you will stay with your people in the desert. You're dying in the desert. Remember, he was the leader of the generation. Remember that every 20 years old and older, except for jo jo uh, Jacob, uh, Joshua, and Caleb, and they will, they will all die. That's why Miriam had to die, Aaron had to die. But you see, what was God was saying, Moses, you need to stay behind because that because this is the generation. You will die with them. You will you will stay with them in the wilderness. Why? Because all that generation stayed in the wilderness. So as a good leader, Moses says, God says to him, your people in the desert, you're you're, you're dying with them. You will stay with that generation. You are their rabbi. You are their teacher. Your congregations will die in the desert. You will die with them. This is why the true leaders stay with their people. Amen? Uh -huh. Amen. Anyway, there's another yeah, yeah. side of that. Okay? Okay, so uh, we're going gonna, we're gonna to fast forward. We're not going to talk about the death of Aaron. Uh, not this time, but we're going to go to... The verse relating on next, I guess you don't turn. We're going to talk about the red heifer. Say that the red heifer. The red We're going to talk about the red heifer. So, the, the, uh, cleansing is required due to our exposure or contamination resulting from death. So, here, the, 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 the concept of cleaning remember, there are seven conditions that will make us unclean. It doesn't mean that we sin. Like, for example, a woman that gives birth, she will be unclean if it's a baby boy for 30 days, seven plus, plus 30 days, first seven, and then uh, there's a one day, uh, uh, so she can circumcise the child, and then 30 days later. If it's a baby girl, 14 days, and then 60 days, double. If, uh, if a person, um, has uh, uh, leprosy, you are also unclean. So, so if, you, if you study the seven conditions that make us unclean, it all points to death or potential death. So all tuma or all uncleanliness or the state of being impure is based or connected with death. Why death? Why does death cause to make us to be unclean? Because death came into the world. Why? How did that come? By virtue of Adam's sin. So Hashem is, so Hashem's original plan was, we will never die. This body was created by God to live forever. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the, and, and, uh, and a good scientist and a good doctor will tell you, they cannot explain why, you know, if, if our body, if our cells regenerate every seven years, in other words, we are a, a brand new person every seven years. They cannot explain why we age. Because, you know, they, they don't understand why, you know, when, you're, you're, when the cells are duplicating, they're copying, all of a sudden, 
the, the, the quality of the copying becomes bad and bad. And they cannot explain it. And the only reason why we are dying is because of what? Say because of sin. Say because of sin. So uh, when we ate of the forbidden fruit, it brought death into the world. So every single time we encounter death, say that every single time we encounter death, we get re-expelled from the Garden of Eden. Remember, because of sin, what happened? Adam and Eve had to be expelled from the Garden of Eden, right? So because death is connected to the sin of Adam and sin expelled us from the, from the Garden of Eden, Eden, so what is Garden of Eden today? Well, if you have the temple, the temple was the Garden of Eden. So remember, if you are unclean, you are not allowed to come into the presence of God in the temple. So like it's like we are being expelled in the Garden of Eden. Are you still with me? It's important for you to understand this concept because remember, the sin of Adam expelled them in the Garden. Sin, uh, uh, the sin brought, brought death. Death expelled mankind from God's presence. So what? So. Uh, if we want to spend eternity with God, we need to what? We need to be cleansed. Say that we need to be cleansed. Amen? So, okay, so, so what is the root of the sin of Adam? If you think about it, why, why, did, uh, why was Adam so attracted with the temptation of the Nikash, the serpent? Why? Because it was about ego. It was about arrogance. Wanting glory and honor. How did the, the, the Nikash or the snake entice Eve? The first strategy was because Adam told Eve, remember God said, you are not to eat of the tree. What did, what did Adam tell Eve? You are not to touch the, the, the tree. So he added to the word. See that? He added the word. So that's why it's important not to add to the word of God. The word of God said, don't eat. So when, when, when Eve told the serpent, oh, I will not allow to touch it. So what did the serpent do? He pushed Eve to the tree and then she touched the tree. And, then, and he said, if she, did, 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 did you die? Did anything happen to you? So, you know, what your husband told you is a lie. Are you seeing me? So that's the first strategy of the enemy. So nothing happened. The Kasal says they didn't, don't add to the Torah. And the second thing, he marketed the fruit. He says, this is the God pill. See that the God pill. Remember the, the matrix, the blue pill and the red pill. He said, if you take this pill, you will become like God, knowing good and evil. Are you still with me? So he, he marketed the fruit as to become like God. Mastery of good and evil. The ultimate ego trip. A lot of people today, they that you know they think they're God. Yes, we are created in the image of God. Uh, what does that mean? Meaning, there's many dimensions about us that is like God. For example, we have the ability to create. We have the ability to to uh, to uh, to use our imagination, our our knowledge, our wisdom to cure diseases. For example, Amen. To drain the swamp. If you want to make, say that. So, in other words. It does not mean, though, that we are like God. It means, rather, we have the attributes. We have the uh, human personality that are divine attributes. Like I said, among them, creativity, initiative, wisdom, understanding, right? We are technically, we are given the, the mandate, the religious mandate to what? To... To glorify God in this world, right? We are, we are, we are, God made us in charge of this world. We have to take care of the world. Amen? You cannot expect your dog to take care of the world. Are you, are you still with me? So mankind has been given that task. Why? Because God gave us a lot of his abilities, about, about his character, about his attributes. Amen? Are you still with me? Yes. Because that's one way we exemplify being in the image of God. To kind of take charge of the world in various ways. So in various ways, we are godly in certain things. Of course, of when we are holy, it's even more, right? Certainly. But the problem is, 
we can easily slide into arrogance. Why we think that, oh, you know, you know, do you think that because people are very smart, they think that, you know, yeah, they're very strong, all of a sudden arrogance begins to play, right? This, this couple of years, mankind, they thought that they have, you know, they don't need God. You know, they had all the technology, they all had all the science, they, ha they had all the, the systems, supposedly, and then one tiny virus, one tiny cell, shut down the whole world. Again, you know, when we think we are masters of the world, hey, God said, you know what? You're nothing, amen? <laughs> We're just ashes that things can, 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 can slow down, can, can rapidly change. Why? Because we are not the master of our faith. God is. We think we are, but we are. So, so the only thing, say that, the only thing, only thing that separates us you know between the creator and the creator you know what's what's the the big dip, what's the big gap you know what the big gap is that say that that is the ultimate reminder for us hey you know what you're not god right because that is the only one that reminds us why when you, God said in Ecclesiastes, it's better to be to come to the house of mourning than in the house of feasting. Why? Because ultimately it will remind you, by the way, I won't live forever. I'm not God. So that is a reminder that we are not God. Say that we are not God. So death can be seen not so much as a punishment by God, but really a reminder that we are not God. Amen? <laughs> Meaning that gap between creator and created. We have so many godly attributes. Yes? But say that, but. but we are not God. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> so, what, so, 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 so the attributes... Uh, so, so now, what will make us God is if we are able, we don't live forever, but if we are able, so the ultimate connection of impurity is that that is, is connected to sin at the Garden of Eden that requires expulsion from the garden, which was equal to the temple today. It is connected ultimately to arrogance, ego, thinking we are masters of our faith. And it is that that ultimately reminds us that we are not and explains why if that comes to the world because of arrogance, why the purification rituals that liberate us from death are rituals of humility. Think, think about that. A person touching a dead body again, uh, what must we do if we touch a dead body? The ashes of red heifer is sprinkled on you on the third day and on the seventh day. And then after you're sprinkled, the best thing you need to do is you need to go into a mikvah or a baptism. And then when you do that, you will be clean in the evening. Say that you will be clean in the evening. So that's the ceremony. So if you go to the next slide. Uh, oh, so we'll sorry, go back. So the mikvah. Um, the mikvah or baptism today, the baptism today, the concept of baptism is not the concept that the Christians believe. It's not a one-time thing. Baptism happens sometimes daily, monthly, yearly. It's, it's always happening. Why? Because we're constantly, constantly in Yeshua. Amen? We're constantly dying to self. Amen? Amen. So, so mikvah, uh, the sprinkling of the red heifer, of course, it's suspended today. Ashes is said to be the greatest symbol of humility. When Abraham prays for the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham declares he's not really worthy. I am but ash and dust. Mm -hmm. The mikvah is when we put ourselves, we immerse ourselves in the water. We dip ourselves, the whole body is, is immersed in the water. And what happens? It reminds us of when we were in the mother's womb. We were, we were, wow. we were inside the uh, Man. what do you call the uh, the liquid fluid? What do you call the amniotic fluid? And uh, that's why when you come out of there, you are a new creation. Amen. Wow. 
So it, again, so very, 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 uh, you know, we are not only humble, but we are recreated. You see the correlation here. If death comes in the world because of arrogance, pride, and ego, therefore, I am expelling from, I'm expelled from the garden. I now get purified and readmitted by how? By humility, by modesty, by submission. This is the idea of the ashes. This is precisely why we obl obliterate the ego in our arrogance. We achieve immortality. Can you imagine, listen guys, can you imagine if we are to, to, uh, to enter heaven and we still have a lot of our ego with us? Can you imagine when God stands up from his throne, guess what? <laughs> you would probably... Then people will try to race and try to sit on God's throne. Amen. <laughs> God will not have that. Say that God will not have that. It's not going to happen. <laughs> it's not going to happen. So let's talk about the red heifer. Go next. Year. So the red heifer, yeah, in Numbers chapter 19, Sister uh, uh, Ellen read it to us. It's, uh, it, it's a very good read. What's interesting about the red heifer, it, the, the red heifer, uh, it's a very unique animal. Why? Because the it's not fiery red. It's brown, brown. But there's not the, to, to, in order for it to be kosher. There's they, there's there's not, there's not there's, they, they only allow one black hair, but all the rest should be red. If there's what there's more than one, it disqualifies the animal. The second thing is the animal should not have been yoked. In other words. There was no yoke placed on it. It should be unblemished without any white or black spots, no defects, no wound, no injury, not used to carry any yoke. It was the only sacrifice that specifically required the animal of a particular core. Remember, you can bring any animal as long as there's no blemish, no, a, a kosher animal, a cow, any color, but the red heifer is the only one, extremely rare, extremely rare. And it brings, brings it to Eleazar. It's interesting that the, 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 the Eleazar is the one administering the red heifer. Interesting, why? Because remember in the story of, of uh, Abraham uh, sending, Elias, sending his servant to, watch, to find a bride for Isaac, what, who did he send? It's it, it's not mentioned, but the servant there is is Eliasar supposedly representing the Ruach Hakodesh. So here, the Ruach Hakodesh is the one administering the red heifer. And what's what's, a, what's unique about the, this red heifer? It's it's the only sacrifice. It is the only sacrifice that is done outside of the temple. Normally, oh, yeah. normally, the sacrifice happens on the temple. On the altar, yeah. but this one is taken out. You know where they take where they take the the, the red heifer? They take him to the Mount of Olives. Say yes. that the Mount of Olives. Yeah. Say wow! Say wow! Wow! Yeah. And not only that, when when the animal is slaughtered, the animal has to be facing the temple. In other words, yeah. the animal, the red heifer, he's standing and facing the temple, and then his throat is slashed. Yeah. And as, as they burned the, 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 the red heifer, they would go to the next idea. They would start throwing cedar wood. They would start throwing hyssop. They would start throwing uh, uh, hyssop. What is that reminding us of? It reminding us about the cleansing of the leper. When the leper is cleansed, he used to bring a cedar wood. He was to bring a, a dove. And they were, he was to be dipped in the blood. And he was to be dipped in cedar. So here, as they were burning, burning the, the animal, and remember, the entire animal is burned. See that the entire animal is burned. Yeah. And not only that, when they when they collect the blood, <clears throat> as they as it's being burned, they collect the blood, they will sprinkle the blood seven times in front, say that in front, in front. of the, the temple. Seven times. Why seven times? 
So I prayed about it. He said, Then why seven? Why? Because seven times, see that seven times, seven times. Yeshua spilled his blood. The first time was when, when the high priest slapped him, or the, the, the servant of the high priest slapped Yeshua. Blood spilled. And the second time is when they were when they were banging him, when they were they were soldiers. the soldiers were 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 banging him. And then the, the third time is when they they when they whipped him, 39 lashes. Yeah, yeah. The fourth time is when when they put nails on his arms. The fifth time, yes, the crown of thorns is the 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 the, the fourth one. Is the fourth one the fourth one? Yeah. Okay, the fifth one is when they when they put nails on his arms and they put nails on his feet the sixth time. And then the final one is when they struck him on the side. Oh, yeah. oh, wow. That's the seventh one. Amen. And blood and water. Came out. Amen. So here, so here, okay, let's let's go. Let's go to Yeshua. Go to the next slide. So here, the then the ashes again in the altar, when when the when the burnt offering is offered, they take the ashes and they, they disregard the ashes, they take it somewhere. But here, what they do, they do, they collect the entire ashes and also the entire animal say the entire animal yeah. is burned yeah. not anything is taken yeah. even the dung say that even the dung yeah. everything is burned and then they collect the ashes and then uh, when they collect the ashes can you imagine this big heifer mm. they collect all the ashes and then they keep it and then they distribute it all over Israel because remember the cleansing happens everywhere. Mm. And then when a person gets contaminated with, with a dead body, gets exposed. Remember, the the the, the highest tuma or the highest uncleanliness is death, right? Uh, if you touch a dead body of your relative, then you'll be unclean for seven days. So to be clean, you the, uh, the, what happens is they you come before the priest, he will get. Uh, a, a, a living water, put it in a bowl. He will put ashes, and he will sprinkle you on the third day. Say so he will sprinkle you on the third day. You come back. You come on the seventh day. They will sprinkle you again on the seventh day, and then on that seventh day you go to a mikvah. And in the e in the morning of the seventh day, on the evening of the seventh day, which is the night, the night eighth day, you are clean. Amen. <laughs> are you still with me? Yeah. Mm. Okay. So that's that's the now let's go let's go to the next slide Jesse. So now here we see here that the red heifer is like Yeshua. Why? Because there should not be any what, net any blemish. Yeah. Amen. Uh, the, the you know the, the so uh, without sin in First Corinthians chapter five verse twenty one for he had made him to be sin for us who do no sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in it. So, so there's a red heifer without spot or wrinkle, a unique animal, rare, specific to the Messiah, is the only one without sin, the only begotten. So, like I said, the entire animal, go to the next slide, is sacrificed. Yeshua uh, was sacrificed, not one of his bones were broken. Amen. He was slain outside. Go next time. He was slain outside, facing the Mount of Olives, facing the temple. That's why when the soldier, when the soldier was standing beside Yeshua, they saw the curtain of the temples ripped in two. And when he said, "It is finished," why? Why were they able to see that? Why? Because they were facing the temple. So here you see here. As the red heifer is facing the temple, so was Yeshua was facing the temple, the Mount of Olives, the exact crucifixion side of the Messiah. Slain outside the camp, facing the temple, the Holy of Holies. Mm -hmm. Yeshua was crucified outside the temple, facing it. Mm -hmm. The blood of the red heifer sprinkled seven times towards the temple. Mm -hmm. Yeshua's blood poured towards the temple. Mm -hmm. Yeshua's blood sprinkled seven times. Amen. Ashes mixed in water. Cleanse the person. Yeshua is the living water. If you confess your sins, amen, he will cleanse us. So, so it says here in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctification of his spirit unto obedience, the sprinkling of the blood of Yeshua the Messiah. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Hebrews chapter 12, 24. And to Yeshua, the mediator of the new covenant, 
in the blood of the sprinkling of that that speaketh better things than Abel. Revelation chapter one, and Yeshua the Messiah, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten from the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from his own blood. So the red heifer is administered. Go to the next slide, let's see. So here, uh, one next slide. The person that touches the dead body. So what happened? Like I said, the third day, he comes before the priest, he's sprinkled. The seventh day, he's sprinkled again. And then on the seventh day, he also goes to a mikvah, and then he's, he is clean. So go to the next slide. So here we see here that there's a prophecy in Daniel that there's going to be a third temple. Daniel chapter 9. Knowing therefore, understand, that from the going forth of the commandment to restore to, and to rebuild Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince will be seven weeks, three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the walls even in troubled times. So, so uh, he's talking about the, uh, the, the third temple. And it, at least in, 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 in Ezekiel, what, what we sang this morning, is says, therefore I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all the countries. I will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you. So here it's a prophetic picture of the, the, the messianic rule when Yeshua will rule and reign on the seventh year, the seventh millennia. And he will sprinkle, sprinkle water upon you and you will be clean from all your filthiness and from your idols and I will cleanse you. Verse 26, and a new heart will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart of your flesh and will give you a heart of flesh and put my spirit in you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them and you shall dwell in the land of your father that I gave your fathers and you shall be my people and you shall be my God. Go next slide. So here we see here that we are living in uh, the, the, the sixth millennia from Adam. What happened on the third day? On the third millennia, what happened? Moses came in. What did, what Moses represent? Moses represent the giving of the written word. Say that the written Torah. Yep. So the written Torah came. It was sprinkled. The word of God was spoken. And now we are waiting for the Ezekiel prophecy, chapter 36, where he talks about that there will come a time when he will come and he will sprinkle us. On the seventh year, on the seventh millennium, go next side. So go next side. See here, we connect that uh, Moses gave them the Torah. That's the first sprinkling. And then Yeshua will rule and reign from Revelation chapter 20. He will rule and reign for a thousand years. He will teach the Torah to the nation. He will baptize us with his word. And the word will now become not the written word, but the living word in our hearts. Amen. So uh, you can see here the connection of the red heifer to Yeshua. Go next slide. So we're running out of time. So now we're going to connect the, the brazen serpent. So what happened is the children of Israel, the, the new generation. So as they are about to enter the promised land, again, the enemy is trying to create controversy. So they started to complain. What did they complain about? This time it was that water. They were complaining about the manna. See that they were complaining again. See that they were complaining again about the manna. So what does the manna represent? The manna represents Yeshua, the living word. So they're complaining about the Torah. See that they're complaining about the Torah. In the last days, people will be complaining about the Torah. They said, oh, the Torah is done away with. You're, 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 you're putting us, you're putting uh, burden upon yourself. Remember, the word of God, the law is only a burden if you are doing it out of obligation. But if you're doing it out of the love of God, then it is not law. Say that it is not law. It is love. Say that it is love. Say that it's love. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So a lot of people don't understand, you know, it's not salvation. We're talking about salvation here. Salvation has can only come to Yeshua. But if you want, if you want to serve God in your life, 
if you want, if you love God and you want to demonstrate your love for him, what do you need to do? You need to follow his word. What do you need to do? Do you need to get the book of Mormons and understand what it is to be a good person? Or do you get the book of Socrates, understand Greek philosophy? Or are you going to get the book of Buddha? No, we're going to go to the word of God, the word of God. Word of God. Amen. 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 And we're going to follow the word. Why? Because we love, not, not because of anything else. Remember, if our motives are wrong, God doesn't want us in heaven. Why? Because only the humble and the contrite heart. Amen. Only those that are obedient to his word. We can rule and reign with him. Amen? Amen. So here, the generation, again, start to murmur. We are living in the last days. People are murmuring against the Torah. But God said, no, listen, I make, say, so God said, okay, he says, to, Moses said to Moses, make yourself a fiery serpent and set upon a pole and it shall be that everyone that was bitten, remember, because of their complaint, God raised a fiery serpent and bit them and they died, many died. And God said, okay, make the same, listen, in, 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 in the kingdom of God, God uses the same remedy for the, for the problem. In other words, if you have a stab wound, God will use the same knife to heal you. Amen? So Amen. here God said, okay, there was a fiery serpent that's biting you. I'm going to create a fiery serpent. And when you look upon it, you will be saved. So here Moses made a serpent from bronze. Bronze symbolizes what? Bronze symbolizes redemption. No, judgment. Judgment. And judgment underneath the altar. Remember, silver is redemption, but bronze is judgment. So judgment upon the pole, but he that was bitten by the serpent, if you are bitten, anyone, when you look upon the serpent, you will live. So here, for thousands of years, see that for thousands of years, they don't understand why God made Moses create almost like an idol. In fact, in First Kings, you see there that uh, King Hezekiah had to destroy that, had to melt that brazen image. Why? Because the people were worshiping that, that serpent. So they didn't understand. In First Kings, you know, verse eighteen, chapter eighteen, Hosea destroyed this brazen serpent because people were worshiping it. They were calling it. They were they were calling it another god. So here, go to the next slide. So here. Yeshua finally explains it. He finally explains the purpose of the brazen altar. See that the brazen altar. Brazen altar. Why? Oh, the brazen serpent. Why he says here, if, if I said to if I said earthly things to you and you still don't understand, he was still telling Nicodemus, how much more if I tell you heavenly things? How are you to believe if I say you heavenly things to you? And no one has ascended to heaven except the one who has descended from heaven, the son of man. Verse 14, listen. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so also is it necessary for the son of man be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. So here, Yeshua is again, you know, the sign, one of the signs of the Messiah. Okay? Whosoever, say whosoever. Whosoever. Will, will, uh, will look upon him. We look upon him. Uh, 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 Pastor June read earlier the voice that came from heaven. He said, This is my beloved son, whom I'm well, very well pleased. Follow him. Say that, follow him. So when, when we look at Yeshua, say when we look up Yeshua, Yeshua, did Yeshua say, Forget the Torah? Did he say that? Did Yeshua say, You know, uh, you, you, the Torah is no longer applicable? Did, did he say that? No. He said, Teach the nations to obey all things that I commanded you. Amen? Amen. So, we, we, when we raise Yeshua, when we look up to Yeshua, we are actually saying, yes, you are the living Torah. We're going to follow you. Amen? Amen. So, to Amen. That, that, we're going to conclude. I'm going to say that in the case of two cut statutes of the red heifer and the bronze serpent, we clearly see the connection of Yeshua the Messiah and why he needs to return the second time to administer the final seven-day cleansing and the mikvah 
when we finally put the living Torah in our hearts. As you can see, pride, anger, and arrogance needs to be eradicated in our lives so we can live and reign with him. Are you making yourself ready today? today? Let Amen. us pray. So Elvino Marquino, our Father, our King, we thank you. We thank you that there is a Messiah. We need a Messiah that, 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 that will be able, that is not exposed to our weakness, our infirmities, who is able to come and cleanse us. We thank you, Yeshua, will come and cleanse us. And we're looking forward for the day when you will return and rule and reign with yeah. in, in mm. Jerusalem. Father, we thank you today. We thank you for your people. We thank you for uh, those that are able to join us live and those that are on, on Zoom. We thank you for those that are listening to this, to this uh, uh, video. May they, may they know you. May, may they know the Messiah, the true living Messiah, Yeshua. The, the living Torah, may we learn to serve you by obeying your words. Let's start with that. And we thank you today, Father, for calling us, yes. for calling us into your kingdom. Yes. May your name be blessed in our lives. Yes. May we be the light. May we be worthy to carry your light wherever we go. We ask in Yeshua the Messiah. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Amen.